Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome into my little alcove of Arcana. I am back singing my one familiar song. So good to see you. I have missed you so much. So glad it's over. I have missed you so much. Hey, thanks for taking the time to pry open that third eye of yours. Hopefully by now you've heard the last episode with Gordon White and Jay Springett because it is a great companion piece to the conversation you're about to hear with our guest, Dr. Casper Opstrup. Casper is a writer and researcher of what he calls radical culture, specializing in concatenations of art and literature, radical politics and occultism as counterculture and underground phenomenon. He published his PhD in book form back in November 2017. It's called The Way Out, Invisible Insurrections and Radical Imaginaries in the UK Underground, 1961 to 1991. And the book charts a hidden history of experiments with cultural engineering with the hopes of expanding current discussions of art, media, politics, radical education, and the occult revival. Along the way, we encounter a series of figures, including William Burroughs, Brian Geisen, Genesis Peoridge, and Alexander Trocki, all of whom blurred the lines between inner and outer and the invisible and the material. But instead of turning things upside down, the world was to be changed from the inside out. And all of that sets the stage for our conversation here today, so enough prologue. Let's flip the script to dialogue, alright? Dr. Casper Opstrup is in the house, your house, right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year's 1990. Welcome to a culture. Casper Opstrup, I am quite thrilled to have you here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for asking. No problem, no problem. You know, your name has been on my list for quite a while now, and I have been slacking in trying to get you on the show. And I say that because I've been dying to hear you talk about your book, The Way Out. The subtitle of that is Invisible Insurrections and Radical Imaginaries in the UK Underground 1961 to 1991. Uh, You published this back in November 2017, so it's been out for about 14 months now, hence my uh, slacking comment there. I guess we should start by talking about what led you to write this book. You know, give us the details on that. What was going on in your life when The Way Out, you know, sort of nestled its way into the, the bosom of your artistic and creative mind? Basically, it was written as a PhD in uh, London at the London Consortium. So, I mean, uh, earlier I was, uh, I was working in an art collective. I moved to London. I spent a few years working. And then uh, I saw this PhD program, which was sort of like trying to create a new type of public intellectual. And at the same time, with the art we had been doing, I had become really interested in situationism. And in London, trying to get my head around this sort of like underground and where it was today and how it had come to be what it was and all this kind of stuff especially some ideas in the 90s underground i was really interested in and then uh, i began this phd and i had stumbled upon this essay by alexander trocky called uh, a revolutionary proposal 
And I basically just wanted to take that essay and shake it for all its association. He has these notions of an, invis an invisible insurrection, that he's becoming a cosmonaut of inner space and all these kind of things. And then I just wanted to trace, you know, like what kind of future does this essay actually sort of entail if you take it literally? What kind of be what kind of you know ways of living, ways of being, ways of being together, what sort of like future utopia, so to speak, is uh, is it sort of like uh, pushing for? Because to a certain extent, uh, Trucky was this highly cultured figure who had lived in in Paris, and his essay is sort of like summing up uh, a lot of the ideas from the avant-garde movements of the early twenty of the early twentieth century. But at the same time, he brought basically a lot of stuff from LSD to situationism to Britain. Yeah, and so you mentioned. Yeah, situationism there, and that's associated with a group to uh, Situationist International, and yeah. that's come up. That came up on a, sh a show I did by myself uh, last. Uh, when was that? Last May, sometime, where I was talking about the Society of the Spectacle, and I explained that concept briefly. So you know, maybe we could talk just a little bit up front here about. Okay, so define situationism for you know people who don't know what that is, and then what this group Situationist International has to do with it, and then maybe we could talk about that Society of the Spectacle too. Yeah, the Situationism, the Situation, they have this idea. They were a group of French, primarily artists. Oh, not really. Uh, they, they began in the 1950s. In 1957, they gathered artists together after the Second World War who in a way wanted to renew the, the momentum of surrealism. But they thought surrealism was kind of old, it was passé, it was sort of like dead after the World War. But they still had this idea about, you know, changing the world by through art and changing, um, uh, you know, having a, a total critique of the way we are being sort of controlled in the world. So so basically, a lot of uh, three artistic groups gathered together to make the international. And with being situationists, they took this term from Sartre that they wanted to create situations where you could sort of awaken from the way you are being controlled by society, being conditioned by society. This society of the spectacle is kind of a social relation that makes you a spectator to your own life and therefore keeps you passive. So instead of being like active in the way you're living your life or sort of like making it happen by yourself, you will always be the sort of spectator seeing life at a distance and thus be sort of the passive uh, recipient of what's going on instead of being empowered to actually sort of act and maybe change the direction. So the society of the spectacle is this sort of bread and circuses idea that it keeps you under control by endlessly circulating the same informations like trivialities, but treating them like revelations and discoveries and creating this sort of like media architecture, which uh, sort of overwhelms you with images and keeps you passive, right? But I mean, with Trucky, just to take Trucky, right? Trucky is this sort of like fascinating figure. He was sort of called the Lord of Junk and the first prophet of permissiveness in the UK counterculture of the 60s. But he is essentially a writer. He was a beat writer. He became a beat writer. He started out writing sort of existentialist novels. And then he met, met the beats. And the beats, they had this sort of project of, you know, inner exploration, finding some sort of like new soul, so to speak. And uh, where the situationists, on the contrary, wanted to be sort of more of a political group. They sort of like organized themselves after the, the sort of classic vanguard party with the, with a board of directors that could sort of like tell you what to do and what not. And if you were sort of living up to the dogma, but Chucky became, while he lived in Paris, he became a member of one of the predecessors to the SI, as they're called, right? The Situationist International. And the which was called the Letrists. And uh, by joining them, he sort of automatically became a member of 
the SI, when they became situationists, even though at that point he had himself moved to New York, where he uh, was sort of becoming more of a beat writer and more experimenting with hallucinogenics. And uh, he became, according to rumor, Jean Cocteau, the French surrealist, hooked him on heroin. So he became a lifelong heroin addict. And in that way, he's closer to a figure like William Burroughs, right? his most famous book, Kind's book, that came out in 1960, is this book where he's sort of portraying the inner life of a junkie, basically, trying to come to terms with being on the outskirts of society, being this outsider that is both producing art, but is also a junkie, and is thus sort of like a criminal, according to law, and has to sort of be in this conflict with the powers that be and the police and consensus society. And I mean, in his project, Truck's project, which he called Sigma, is this idea where he wanted to sort of fuse the inner exploration of the beats with the sort of political ambitions of the situationists. They were sort of like left uh, communists. So they wanted to have this sort of try to make the world a better place, basically, right? By sharing and building a kind of communist society. But, you know, like trying to expand personal freedom and liberty uh, for the individual in society. And he tried to fuse these two projects, which becomes an idea about that in order to change the world, you need to change yourself. So it's through by changing yourself, you can transform the world. But at the same time, the world, how it looks like, it's sort of architecture makes you who you are. So it becomes this sort of like building a new world from scratch, trying to think in what sort of new architecture should we live in? Should it be mobile? Should it be sort of like something you can play your way through? Also related to ideas from situationism. But this sort of heady mix of trying to, through art and artistic practice, produce a new type of man that would create a new type of society. And in order to do this, this is sort of like he tried when he came back from New York for a couple of years, he was part of what's called the Central Committee of the Situationists. But he tried to make them join his new sort of sigmatic a- approach to make this sort of like sigma adventure happen. And they would have none of it because they went more and more political into political theoretical analysis, where Trocky was more sort of like going into the kind of psychedelic counterculture, hanging out with uh, Allen Ginsberg, this British writer called Colin Wilson, who is sort of like semi-occult, where the main theoretic of situationism is called Guy Debord. And Guy Debord just didn't want to have anything to do with all this kind of mystic cretins, as he, ha- he apparently called uh, Ginsberg and Wilson. And I guess instead, Truckee decided to uh, gang up with a group of uh, people that were more sort of like coming from beat, but actually having all kind of specializations. But, you know, like artists, writers, architects, and try to get them engaged in this idea about that they needed to make this invisible insurrection, uh, which is his term, which is also the subtitle of my book. Uh, where the, inf- the invisible insurrection, in a way, is this way of transforming uh, yourself through kind of creative artistic practice and thus take over the world by injecting these ideas into culture, uh, as, use culture as a vehicle to make people think in another way, like create a new way of thinking. So people, they gradually, you know, you would have a revolution without bloodshed where, you know, the situation is revolution probably would have ended with people standing up against the wall, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, so I want to bring in another component to this, you know, because you're talking about all these ideas that on the surface sound tremendously beneficial for the individual and then also, I guess, for the collective as well, you know, personal freedom and, you know, taking control of your life back, stop being a spectator. But yeah. on some level, like... It feels like you're still sort of being manipulated by a group who has a, a political or socio-political 
end game to all of this. And yeah. I think we should talk about this as still a component of a cultural engineering program. Would you agree with that? That 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 is exactly what they're doing. They're trying to just engineer culture in a different way for their own benefit. Totally. I mean, absolutely. They have this idea about basically that the artists should be in control of the world. So they still have a notion, you know, of a kind of an elite, but where this elite should, you know, everybody should become artists. Everybody should become some sort of magician because they're sort of linking it all with, with magic at a later point. We're saying, you know, like uh, magic is uh, the superstructure's superstructure. But yeah, they are sort of like an elite gang of conspirators who think that they have had an insight into authenticity, a truth that they want to share, that they want uh, the whole world to to sort of like, they're saying they're, they're sort of like classic avant-garde or vanguard. So they are nothing that the whole world is not meant to become, you know? So they're sort of like the, the forerunners of evolution. They're sort of the prototypes of this new man that or woman that we all should become by them sort of accelerating at kind of evolution, you know, age of Aquarius, this whole idea about that, that we are just in front of, you know, tremendous systemic change and they can initiate this, they can make it happen. But basically it is the artists who want to take over the world and realize this sort of classic utopia from avant-garde uh, art from the early 20th century, like Dada and surrealism and futurism, where, where they all sort of like, it ties in also to, I mean, the birth of modern occultism, right? That this is, you know, we are right before a major evolutionary step that will change everything. And we need to make it happen. Hopefully it will happen in our lifetime but the old order is broken. The old symbols, the old language is no longer valid. And therefore, new symbols, uh, fresh languages, they need to be invented. And we need to invent them. But they also want to turn everybody into collaborators on this project. It's not like they don't have an end result. They don't know how the future will look like. The future is unknown, but they make it into a project of survival, as they're saying. Listen, if the powers that be, they keep being in power, they will drop the atomic bomb. Or like today, where we have sort of like climate catastrophe and all these kind of like this notion that we are sort of on the border of entering an age of annihilation or extinction. And therefore, if we need to survive, we need to drastically change and experiment with new forms of life, new forms of being. And this experimentation is something everybody should participate in. Everybody should be active in, and not necessarily with Chalky, but then you have to make your own group, make your own sort of affinity group, your own form of collectivity where you can sort of, it's kind of classic anarchism, right? That you have this kind of new tribe and you will then be sort of in a network relation to all these other tribes or fellow travelers who is sort of working on this huge project of survival, which is also at the same time an evolutionary project. It wants to create a new society by creating something that becomes post-human in one way or the other. So, I mean, all these ideas are sort of, I mean, that was what I found so fascinating also with Truckee's essay and project. And I mean, it never came to anything. It was widely distributed, but the money they raised and they even had People like John Lennon uh, giving them money, sponsoring bits of it, but they used all the money on heroin, right? They just shattered up their arms and were, so it's a pipe dream. It's a pipe dream I still think is really fascinating and in a lot of ways uh, valid. It's valid to sort of mine the experiences they did with this project while at the same time, you know, it is sort of historical today, but it's just, it connects a lot of, both historical predecessors to what became the counterculture of the underground of the 1960s, while at the same time it gave that movement a sort of trajectory. It gave them a, a direction to go, right? Where many of them are still with us, even though I think that sort of 
impetus from the 60s probably faded out more or less completely during the 90s. It has become sort of an artifact today. It's kind of archaeological, but it's still talking to our time because we still, all the problems they addressed are still with us. They're not solved. And we are still having these debates about, you know, that change will come and it will uh, most likely be unpleasant, you know, in terms of climate change and all these kind of crises we're living in. So to that point, Casper, you used the term in the book, and I think you actually borrowed it from Genesis Peorage, but I think we're talking about cultural alchemy. This is kind of what we're describing here, which blends well with the occult and the esoteric component to this and, and that sort of lens. But yeah. you also said in the book that this is really about a reconciliation of opposites, which, again, is a fundamental alchemical principle, maybe the fundamental principle. Just with that term cultural engineering, I mean, cultural engineering is something that Trocky, he starts to say that they are cultural engineers because what they're doing is going beyond art, beyond politics. They're sort of going into the new, and with the new here, they are cultural engineers. So they're trying to engineer culture to go to a certain in a certain direction. Basically, they want to put out some ideas through culture, and this will become what he calls the invisible insurrection of a million minds. So it'll become sort of, it will go viral, and everybody will sort of be infected by this idea and sort of agreeing to it. Because uh, for for Trocky and his collaborators, obviously, it's it makes perfect sense. The connection to Genesis Peorage is because one of the Sigma collaborators was William Burroughs. And William Burroughs, he built further upon some of the ideas from Sigma when Sigma sort of faded out. I mean, Sigma began around 1960, 1961. By 1967, it was basically completely uh, gone, right? It was had been swallowed by time. But uh, Burroughs continued and called it now Academy 23. Some of the same ideas, this idea, they wanted to create what they're calling a, a spontaneous university. Like they want to make a center where we can meet and unlearn what we already know and then relearn what we need to know together. And Obviously, Academy 23, it was a series of articles in Mayfair, which is a British uh, equivalent of Playboy. And these articles had a tremendous impact also on the counterculture. Burroughs went on to write these essays like An Electronic Revolution. And this is actually sort of kind of the birthing moment of what became industrial culture. So with Genesis Peoridge and the Temple of Psychic Youth, that he created after Thrupp and Gristle and these kind of early industrial bands, then the uh, Temple of Psychic Youth was, was sort of built upon Burroughs's ideas for finding a new way of thinking through the cut-up and some of these, of these methods. And then Genesis began to also talk about this, that it was cultural engineering. And he, so he is using this on Burroughs, saying that, Burroughs and Burroughs's close collaborator, Brian Geisen, are modern alchemists. And what they're taking is that they're making, you know, society into this sort of uh, alchemic jar where, where it goes back to the way that I'm saying that the drive of situationism is to renew a surrealism. And surrealism, the basic idea in surrealism is that you take two things that doesn't belong together and you put them together. Right, so you're you're juxtaposing heterogeneous elements, as they say, but in this meeting between the two, the new can arise, you know. And this is like the alchem the alchemical work that you 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 take things apart, you purify them, and you put them together again. And in putting them together again, they will be better, more beautiful, bigger than they were to begin with. So this sort of purification process of reconciling the inner with the outer, uh, the esoteric with the exoteric, and all these kind of binaries that they want to put together. I mean, to a certain extent, you can say Genesis continued this project with the Pandrogeny projects, where, where, you know, like taking the male and the female into some kind of third new unknown to a certain extent, but also just that this meeting between the two, instead of being opposition, then it becomes 
generative of sort of like new ideas, revelations. This is where the new is capable, where the new can be produced by clashing these two together, which is a fundamental alchemical thought, right? It's pure alchemy. Genesis, obviously, already with Burroughs. Burroughs, to a certain extent, I guess it, it has become known through the reception of Burroughs in the 1980s industrial underground around Temple of Psychic Youth and Genesis Purits, but where they keep addressing that actually Burroughs and Dyson are modern magicians and that they are actually working with in a sort of magic trajectory where, I mean, most people, if you have been in, in, in sort of like cultural studies, or art history, they say like, oh, but uh, Dyson was some sort of like action painter and Burroughs was sort of a beat writer. But when you sort of look at what they actually produced, it becomes tremendously clear that they they have a huge interest in uh, occultism, esotericism, how to make things happen. And I mean, I guess it points to that they were aware that art and magic are fundamentally interlinked in this sort of creating images unrestrained from dogma in the world building aspects of that they're building worlds, they're creating worlds. And then when they want to have these, when they want to make these imaginary worlds real, it's becoming magic and it enters politics because in reality, right, uh, the way we organize is uh, political. Uh, the way we live is political. I mean, it has nothing to do with parliamentary politics, right? But there's just something about how to organized society. Uh, it becomes something you cannot... These three art, politics, and magic begins to overlap in this really interesting way, but where it actually all... The common denominator is that it's a type of fiction that you're trying to realize into the world, which is basically what Sigma was as, as well, right? It is something that grew out of a literary praxis and beginning to think that the power of words is able to convince other people that this might be a plan, right? This might be the new sort of like program of what to do in order to live the good life, if you know what I mean. Yeah, or create the uh, great work, as the alchemists call it. Creating the great work becomes the, the self-transformative part of it. I mean, the, the surrealists, they already had this, they had this catchphrase where they said, uh, transform the world. Marx said, change yourself. And those two words are the catchwords for surrealism. So, you know, this the great word is changing yourself, but by changing yourself, by inventing new symbols, by having a new way of thinking where you're thinking magically, you are actually also changing the world, you're changing social relations in between people, the way we are living together. Yeah, and I got a couple of quotes here that I want to read. Uh, the first one is about Sigma, who you've been talking about. But you said that Sigma, in many ways, can be seen as an attempt to establish a new type of cultic community, a secret society conspiring to create a new religion while worshipping a utopian future not unlike the future visible in a radical interpretation of the Gospels or the anarchist tradition. As such, yeah. Sigma was an alchemical attempt at manufacturing the Philosopher's Stone the key to the kingdom of God, where we are all living in joy and abundance through revelation. So I think that quote goes back to the spectacle and sort of this unveiling, you know, this maybe sort of apocalypse, like showing that you are part of something that, or that you have been a passive part of this spectacle, right? This whole time. And this revelation is meant to, to shake you out of that and I guess sort of put you on a different um, path. Yeah. And I mean, it also goes back to the way that, I mean, this has... This is more or less traceable through all of history, back also to the to the heresies and the heretical movements. This notion that the way the early disciples of Christ were living, where they had everything in common and they shared every kind of thing, is maybe a way to sort of like build the new world upon. And I think this is really interesting because it's also one of the ways that I'm sort of interpreting or reading modern occultism is this attempt at establishing a religion for the future, a future religion, but it's a religion without gods because it's a religion where you take religion in its original sense is that what binds people together in a community, right? It's binding people together 
So this future religion is something that will sort of like in the future be kind of social glue, giving a sense of community. And if you talk about, I mean, you can talk about for ages how you sort of define all these words, you know, like our culture, our cultism, esotericism. But the sort of approach that I kind of operate with is with occultism that happens right after sort of like in the 1850s. And one of the people who are actually sort of inventing occultism is uh, Elie Levy, this French thinker who began as being a Catholic priest and became a socialist revolutionary. And then when it all failed, all these, like 1848 was the big year of revolutions in Europe, right? Where all of Europe was in revolution. And this notion of failed revolutions, hopes that never became anything, turned him towards ceremonial magic or the esoteric tradition that he began to. He's one of the first who builds a system out of it. But this system he's actually building as an attempt to reform Catholicism. So it needs to be a religion, a reformed Catholicism that will be the building stone for a socialist utopia, because he was part of what's called uh, utopian socialism as well, right, as a revolutionary. He went to jail for, for, for taking part in these revolutions before he became uh, Elifa Levy. Elifa Levy is, uh, he was called uh, Alphonse Constant, as far as I remember. I guess you, you, you're fully aware of who I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, just in that whole like in the beginning of modern occultism this hope that this new construct going back to some of the best parts of the pagan world but putting this into a system is actually something that can become social glue for the future that can empower us to act in the world and which is free from the dogma of organized religion and which is free from that kind of submissive relation to uh, a god in the high, because the god, to a certain extent, through the great work, through self-transformation, in a kind of way becomes yourself, sort of proper left-hand path, right? But this notion of self-deification is a huge part of it, right? That you are becoming more, you're becoming godlier, if you can say that. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you don't see any dogma in the occult then? Oh, yeah, sure. Lots of it today, right, in in a lot of ways. But I'm just thinking in that sort of like fundamental impetus of trying to create this new thing, right? But I mean, of course, today the occult is uh, rich on strife and whether you're sort of like your left-hand path or right-hand path or whether you're part of like leftist politics or progressive politics or conservative politics and all these kind of, I mean, everybody have their own take on it, which is probably as it should be. But there's no consensus in it. And obviously, after Elifa Levy, when this sort of tradition becomes kind of dogmatic with Golden Dawn and some of these people, a lot of dogma arises immediately. A lot of proper ways of doing it where you actually need to to get up to sort of like Burroughs and Geisen and the wake of those two sort of like kind of being the birthing of chaos magic in the in the 1980s, right? That where, where these ideas are being set free again, right? But I think in the very, in the first part of the, of the 20th century, it's very much sort of like Golden Dawn and Crowley that is sort of like fairly dogmatic around how to approach these things. I'm just thinking that idea, you know, that, that, that it's oriented towards the future instead of actually sort of oriented towards, towards the past, that it's progressive instead of conservative. Because I guess a lot of people also think when they hear the word occult, that it's sort of arcane or conservative, but it's actually, you know, that idea about that, that you need to create some kind of future social glue, which could be some kind of hermeticism, uh, is basically super important for a lot of these people. And they're thinking it. I mean, this is what's so fascinating also with Sigma and Trocky, that they're trying to to kind of build a a theory of everything, right? So they need to think everything into this, like a new psychology, how to make money on their sort of like what they're doing, how to kind of create this new type of community, which will lack the social glue that Christianity has given traditionally and trying, of course, then to make art this sort of kind of new deity. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, it's, it's super complex, but it's just a, 
there are so many really fascinating uh, ideas in that notion of you know of reinventing the world and rebuilding something you know like it's like those three phases of alchemy again right what do you do when you take it apart which has been what they have been doing in the 20th century right all the sort of artistic movements they took what was there and they broke it apart and they tried to purify it but how is it actually you're fitting it together again and how can it become more than what it was which is the challenge right i mean obviously we're still sort of battling with a lot of these questions and problems and some of them that were sort of deemed historical just 10 years ago has sort of uh, shown the head again reappeared right yeah and so i obviously i'm not a fan of dogma of any sort wherever it comes from i'm also really not a fan of politics and the whole like political way that we go about things these days but it definitely ties in here and i wanted to read a quote and then ask a question uh, but your quote was what these groups held in common was a desire to intervene in this shard of messianic time we call the present on the level of everyday life just as the artistic avant-garde strive to merge art and everyday life thus superseding the category of art the politics of these initiatives are equally striving to merge politics into everyday life going beyond both art and politics in order to supersede capitalist relations by producing new subjectivities new forms of life produced by the meanings of messianism marxism and magic a radically unknown future which has nothing to do with what came before it ephemeral as it was their production was a call for world revolution carried out by artistic means and without any victims end quote so it's interesting to me that they wanted to merge politics into everyday life because i think yeah. you see i think you see that now like that has come to fruition at least on some level everything about your everyday life seems politicized you know your diet what gender you are i mean it's all politicized and it's all being talked about by politicians at all levels and yeah. i guess what i'm curious about is what is the relationship between art and politics in this environment are they suddenly not able to be separated then it depends i mean politics is a lot of things right and uh, i mean the politics of the avant-garde is due to that it's so sort of like utopian where you're talking about you know communism and not the communism of the soviet union right but this communism of holding everything together right and sharing commons and all this kind of stuff right anarchism it's utopian politics with with anarchism uh, which is an ideology that has never actually sort of been tried out so so the it it has nothing to do with sort of like you know uh, trump or, or or that kind of party politics where in the beginning right but i mean today everything as you say is politicized but this is also a way of causing strife in it because i think these politics they're talking about is about social organization how you're sort of like redistributing wealth and organizing yourself socially how we're living together of ways of living and ways of sort of like organizing life where art and politics they become superseded because it becomes this sort of like completely new way of having social relation and having a societal organization where art ceases to exist because it becomes life it becomes that you are yourself the sort of artwork or you're living creatively you're living with the sort of like artistic charts or whatever you want to call it where on the other hand today the way that media and politicians in this way have politicized this discourse is also you know i mean that's part of the spectacle right that's part of like creating strife to a certain way in treating those trivialities as major discoveries or i i and i mean there's a lot of valid stuff in obviously in identity politics and all this kind of stuff but there's also a way of you know keeping it on the level of the spectacle keeping it at as some sort of yes no discussion where you can uh, sort of argue about it all day but where it is not sort of like you know it has nothing to do with for example class war or something like that right i mean it's just something that makes people go into that trench and this trench and sort of like battle it out with each other instead of you know like taking it to the next level you know sort of lifting it together you know where i guess the idea of class war is that you know like the rich people and the poor people and actually wealth should be distributed in another way which is sort of like not a discussion you would have by professional politicians right even though it's super political 
you know, but that's sort of more of the artistic discussion. But of course, there's also that, I mean, identity politics has become sort of like double it today because it by far has been sort of like taken over by the right, you know, and um, a lot of it, it's not really about creating equality between various minorities and groups, but it's about that some people, they want to be uh, the new elite, right? Uh, they want the money. They want to be where it happens, right? So where it becomes more about sort of power positioning, and then it becomes about creating um, another way of thinking that whole field through living creatively or, you know, world building or whatever. Yeah, and I think you segue nicely into what I wanted to talk about now or next, and that's this notion of what is called biopolitics and yeah. biopolitical capitalism. These are terms that I was unfamiliar with before I read your book, so I'm curious if you could just define what these are for us, and then maybe we can get into some of the weeds there. Yeah, yeah, but I guess uh, biopolitics is basically this way that we have internalized control today, right? The way that we are censoring ourselves, the way we are behaving after a certain type of rules and dogmas because that's what we've been sort of conditioned to through through school and universities and church and all these kind of like institutions that are sort of like producing our behavior in a certain way. And then we are internalizing these uh, notions. So it's no longer actually sort of the state that says, don't do this and don't do that. You're doing that yourself already because you've learned that that is sort of the way of uh, going about it. The, the reason why all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's a way of trying to conceptualize the field due to that it was a PhD I was sitting with, right? So so trying to think like a, a, a theoretical approach to this sort of like history from the 60s to the 90s, what's actually happening. And, and it becomes a lot about that kind of idea about that you're conditioned to behave in a certain way and how to kind of break that conditioning that you have internalized control and with Burroughs, he's saying control is basically his word for the fictions the state is telling you. So the way that you are controlled by fictions and narrative through the state. And I mean, what we just talked about with identity politics and this kind of stuff is a huge part of this, right? Because you are actually uh, not saying what you want to say often because you are self-censoring. You're already sort of uh, disciplining yourself. You are taking this, you're internalizing that kind of discipline. So so it's no longer about really policing those lines from above by the state, but we're doing that individually and socially. Yeah, I think the, uh, the biopolitical capitalism too uh, is worth explaining, but let me read a quote first. So you were uh, talking about the work of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, right? Yeah. 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 So you said that uh, production work and its refusal are central. The capacities of biopolitical labor power exceed work and spill over into everyday life. Since work has become immaterial, it is possible to think and form relationships in the street, at home, and not only on the job. We, meaning everybody who works in an office, a school, or a factory, as well as the unemployed and the underemployed, are thus being exploited not only from 9 to 5, but all the time. Since the extraction of a surplus has extended well beyond the classic factory, this means an increasing appropriation of what Marx called the general intellect, the accumulated knowledges and capacities of human life as a whole, including things like habits, everyday practices, forms of know-how, etc., by neoliberal capitalism. Thus, capitalism not only commodifies and sells quantifiable goods and services, but also feelings, affects, and ways of being. End quote. So, how does that biopolitical capitalism then sort of make its way into our conversation here? I mean, with biopolitical capitalism, right, that affect, I mean, this is sort of like the Facebook economy and social media economy, right, that we actually, the whole time contributing to to making the wheels go around right and it ties into all this whole stuff with conditioning and how all our sort of like our feelings and this sort is being part of like that there's no outside to capitalism any longer because we have internalized this whole um, notion of productivity to a certain extent right there's a gazillion things I would like to talk about with that whole um, thing here. One of them is this way of trying to like fictionalize the future, or trying to sort of like making these new religions through art and the role of art in all this kind of thing. Another thing is also, I mean, for me, 
what I was really interested in was the history of some of these uh, collectives and art groups and people working together with these sort of really these fundamental countercultural ideas where I think uh, a lot of the theory, the more sort of like theoretical, was my introductory frame to it. Let's try to bridge that into your more recent work with the occult and the esoteric component to this. You know, you've written a few essays recently about this stuff. What is it about, I guess, that body of, of philosophy or practice that intrigues you the most? And, and why did you choose to pursue that more recently? Yeah, no, I, mean, I guess that's... Uh kind of related to this fundamental idea that we need to create the future and we need that it is sort of like unknown that it's this project of survival where art and literature and you know the whole sort of broad spectrum of the arts has a role to play because imagined becomes imagination becomes fundamental to perceiving ways to go forward from the present you know because the sort of like spectacular society is claiming by always rerunning the same type of information, it is sort of claiming we're living at the end of history, right? So how do you then bring in an idea about how to move on, how to go forward? And when you're talking about this, it becomes like a question of who we are and what we can become. And I mean, if I should just break down what I've been sort of like working with, with, with right? I mean, with the book, I'm talking about how Trocky and Sigma, they wanted to build up this sort of like spontaneous university where we had to relearn how to be together. They did that by fusing beaten situationism, so to speak, right? The, the mysticism and politics, making this sort of like mystical anarchism or mystical utopianism thing. It ran out due to the, you know, like that they were all heroin addicts, basically, right? But at the same time, it became a quest of, Chucky said he was a cosmon out of inner space, so they wanted to explore inner states of mind. They want to, you know, to travel to the edge of consciousness and bring back new experiences, produce new states of mind, a new way of being by sort of like putting these new states of mind into being. And then I'm looking at how this sort of became Basically, it became, on the one hand, the sort of like anti-psychiatry movement around something called London Anti-University, which actually existed for six months or so. So it's not all completely ephemeral. But on the other hand, it became like William Burroughs with Academy 23, where he's beginning to talk about, you know, how to cut up, not only cut up words and images, but also like cut up the body and cut up every kind of uh, possible thing that we have received from the past uh, to to sort of reinvent it. In the book, from Burroughs, I follow it to the Temple of Psychic Youth and follow them up through the 1980s. Like, what did they do? What were their methods? How did they want to sort of organize? What was the sort of aim? Our aim is wakefulness. Our enemy is dreamless sleep, as they're claiming. Looking at these things, you know, like 23 enigmas, how they are building upon Burroughs, but reaching back to sort of Crowley and Austin Osman Spear and these sort of like situations and these kind of ideas. And there I'm sort of telling a story from the 1960s to the 1990s of dreaming an unknown future, but where this future has something to do with continuous mutation that we need to mutate and that that is not only in our way of thinking that has something to do with we need to mutate in our body. Burroughs has an idea that he's actually taking from sort of Crowley and Diane Fortune and these people that we need to sort of become bodies of light so we will become these immortal light beings where we can no longer speak because language is part of what is conditioning us. We will think in a new way where we'll think in images, we will think in associations, which is magical thinking, right? Because magical thinking, as opposed to scientific thinking, is where you're thinking in similarities. You're no longer thinking causally. You're not thinking in cause and effect. You're thinking, is these things sort of like reminiscing of each other? Like, do they correspond? Uh, do they have similarities? And that sort of re- fueling magical thinking, which I think points to totally into our 
you know, sort of like contemporary, where with algorithmic thinking, it's actually a new way of magical thinking because algorithm is also based on similarity instead of causality. So this sort of like that we have to find a new way of thinking, mutate consciousness, go into cosmic consciousness, expanded consciousness, uh, new states of mind at the same time with the body. If we really like Burroughs and Geisen has this sort of really famous uh, adage or whatever you call it, like here to go. Why are we here? We're here to go. Where should we go? We should go to space. So we should go out into outer space in order to do this. These are the sort of ideas I, I ran with from writing this book. Uh, of course, there's also some of the more sort of like theoretical academic discussions that I'm still engaged with. I'm teaching at university and I'm also teaching at the Art Academy. So I can't be totally free of some of those. But I mean, this sort of like mix of ideas is what's really sort of got me, whoa, this is really interesting, right? And I mean, then afterwards, I had uh, two years where I did a postdoc. After my PhD, I had a two-year sort of research project where it was called An Imaginal Kingdom in the Wastelands of the Real, where I'm talking about art, esotericism, and what, what I call the politics of hope. That, that it has this sort of like that the esoteric is something that can revitalize and bring hope to the sort of hopeless. When I'm looking at these sort of anthropologists, in particular one called Ernesto de Martino, but also people I didn't know when I wrote the PhD. I'm just finishing a new book, unfortunately in Danish, about that kind of stuff, but where it ties into, you know, like Christopher Partridge and some of these people who are talking about our culture based from Genesis Purity. So basically what I did for the past two years, at one point looked at the contemporary, like the, the resurgence of occultism in our contemporary. And on the other, I went back, what happened before Sigma, like looking at surrealism and alchemy and symbolism and uh, ceremonial magic, basically. And then having that whole sort of broad trajectory, more or less, you know, like a hidden history about art, politics, and their cult from around the 1850s, 60s, until the, today to the contemporary, pointing towards tomorrow, obviously. I'm now beginning a research project on, on cosmism, this idea that uh, from the Russian cosmists, which ties into that we need to go into space. But to go into space, we need, for example, to have kinship with plants. So we need to mutate. So when we go into space, instead of just becoming these astral bodies that Burroughs is talking about and Crowley and these people, which is sort of like death, right? We need to do it with our bodies and we need to become immortal in our bodies. So therefore we need to, for example, I mean, a, a big part of the thing with occultism is that it's able to renegotiate our relation to nature. And they're, they're specifically looking at plants. So they're saying in space, we don't want to take all this food with us. So what do we do? Maybe we can survive by photosynthesis on sort of sunlight. So therefore, we need, in order to take enough energy from the sun, we probably will have to develop more skin. This surplus skin can then become wings. And then as an, a new benefit to that, we can fly. Or if we, if we get an arm ripped off, we can regrow it as a plant can regrow its limbs and all this kind of stuff. So looking at this sort of like cosmic idea about going into space, it's when what I'm working with at the moment, right, which then ties into Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson, who has this smile project about, you know, space migration, increased intelligence and life extension as an acronym. And seeing on how this is tying up today with notions about transhumanism and all this kind of stuff, this is just to sort of break down what I actually sort of took out from writing the PhD and what I've, you know, what I've sort of like expanded upon, which is some of these idea that in the PhD, I mean, the PhD has this sort of trajectory where it's sort of describing my knowledge curve to a certain extent. So I come to it from sort of like Marxism, anarchism, situationism, and with Marxism, autonomous Marxism, as Hard and Negri, and some of these people that were really, really big post 9 11 in the early 2000s. And along the way, meeting Truckee, seeing that, oh, but this is about reconciliating the inner and the outer, then William Burroughs became this pivotal figure for my personal thinking. And 
they sort of the halfway mark in the book where it goes from Truckee and the London Anti University, and it becomes Academy 23, Burroughs' idea about how we are sort of producing this new future through these new academies where we should learn to, uh, what is he, he's writing, we should learn to be high as the Sin Master is high when his arrow hits uh, the target in the dark, which feeds into basically a uh, Temple of Psyche Youth. And with Temple of Psyche Youth and the last sort of part of uh, the book, I'm totally delving into. One thing they're taking these ideas from is the counterculture. And it is this sort of meeting of uh, art and politics and activism and, and these ideas. And the other goes back to sort of like the esoteric tradition and modern occultism. And what was the sort of thinking of these uh, 1980s chaos magic? And then by looking at that, seeing, okay, but they're having these, they're beginning to talk about a culture instead of occultism. And how a culture then in, you know, in the new millennium has become ubiquitous. It's something that's everywhere. And I mean, in the arts, uh, there's a huge sort of like magical uh, renaissance we are sort of living in, right? And just trying to think through, how did this happen? And what does it entail in uh, like a sort of extended discussion of politics or utopia? But I'm not using the sort of vocabulary any longer of, of biopolitics and spectacular capitalism and these sort of like situationist ideas. Casper, hey, thanks so much for the time. Tell people where they can keep up with your work if they're interested. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, the, the book is easily available from a, a website called minorcompositions.info. It can be bought there and uh, it can also be downloaded as a free PDF. So that's like no excuse not to check it out if uh, anyone is curious about it. Some of my older articles can be sort of like found at this website called academia.edu. I'm not really keeping it up to date, but there's, uh, there, there are a few articles out there. And um, yeah, I guess besides that, I have a, a social media presence and I'm, I am visible on Instagram and Facebook. So uh, do hook up if anybody feels like it. Absolutely. I'll link all that in the show notes. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time here. Really appreciated it. Really enjoyed the chat and hope to talk to you again sometime. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Casper Opstrup. And my thanks to all of you who made it this far. I hope you see how this connects to the previous chat with Gordon and Jay. That solar punk thing is very much an invisible insurrection, much in the vein that Casper described in his book and in this chat with the overlap between art, media, politics, education, activism, and the occult revival, you know, changing things from the inside out, changing things one choice within yourself at a time. I like this phrase in the synopsis of Casper's book, although I am modifying it slightly. But it says, this is just another mechanism of deprogramming and deconditioning us without any plan for the future except one, to just make it happen. But how do you do that? How do you go from passive participant in the spectacle to active participant in your own life? I, I don't have the answer to that. And if I did, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. But I think this experience here that I'm having, that I'm sharing with you, I think this is me trying to figure that out for myself in my own life. And I hope that it helps you do the same. You know, Casper and I also had a bit of an interesting exchange towards the end of the free version of the chat that was a part of the Patreon extension, although I did cut a lot of it out. We had a miscommunication of sorts on what we were actually discussing. Casper wanted to get more into his recent work, which I wasn't too familiar with, and I was focused solely on his book, which I had extensive notes on. But in the end, I think we found a good balance, and that actually may facilitate a follow-up with Casper so we can dig more into his recent writings and perspectives. Anyway, in that Patreon extension, we talked about using fiction and images to navigate a territory, image politics and the production of myth, the situationist idea of detournament and its similarity to cut up, the consciousness consciousness, that's kind of cool, identity politics, immigration, psychogeography, a philosophical idea known as the apparatus, becoming invisible, and refusing identity. Good stuff, if I may say. And a shout out to new patrons who hopefully enjoyed that extension, Daniel, Brandon, and Dwayne, and returning patron Brady, welcome aboard and welcome back, y'all. Thanks so much for the support. Hey, if you want to join them, you can do it. Check out patreon.com slash occulture. 
Anyway, my time this time is up. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.